This is the Truth Be Told podcast, where we unlock the secrets of strategic communication. Welcome to this episode of Truth Be Told. I am excited to introduce our guest today, Dave Zalowski. Dave is a certified forensic interviewer, a certified fraud examiner, and a well-known industry expert in the field of investigative interviewing. Dave himself has conducted well over 10,000 interviews and polygraph examinations across his career. Dave also co-founded Wicklander Zalowski and Associates alongside his partner, Doug Wicklander. Over the last several decades, Dave has been a lead curriculum developer and instructor for the organization, and also consultant on cold cases and other investigations for law enforcement and private sector organizations across the globe. I'm excited for our conversation today, so let's dive in. Welcome to this episode of the Truth Be Told podcast. I am your host, Dave Thompson, and I am honored and excited to be here with a good friend, mentor, and founder, co-founder of Wickliner Zalowski, Mr. Dave Zalowski. How are you, sir? Good, real well. How about you? Um, I'm good. I'm excited about our discussion today because I know a lot of people have submitted questions interested about your your interviewing career and experience, what Wicklander Zalowski is, how come your name got put second instead of first? We can we can argue about that. And then just some kind of specific questions on how interviewing or interrogation has impacted maybe your your day-to-day life. But before we get into any any of that, uh, maybe you can expand a little bit on your early career before you got into uh, founding this company. Well, I... Uh... I went to um, to college and was actually going to be a geologist. Um, that apparently didn't work out too well. <laughs> and uh, yet uh, to be seen, maybe maybe seen, we, yes, I still yeah. have an interest in rocks. But yeah, <laughs> um, I, I took a couple of sociology classes and did an uh, internship with the uh, local police department. And as part of that, I had to do a, a study of. Um, rapes in small rural towns versus large towns like Philadelphia was the other one that I used. And um, when I got out of school, I couldn't find a job in geology because I had a bachelor's degree, which didn't mean anything. And so um, my uh, father had found a ad for a special agent for the railroad. And uh, so I went and applied for that and became a uh, a special agent for Chicago and Northwestern um, Railroad and uh, primarily doing interstate theft and company investigations in northern Illinois. And uh, spent a couple years doing that, then went to a suburban police department and spent uh, about three years there uh, doing patrol investigations. a little bit of everything because it was a smaller department and um, then had a particularly bad night on the street with a drunk driver throwing up on my shoes. <laughs> and uh, so I decided I needed to do something else because I didn't want to be 55 years old in that same situation. So um ended up being trained as a polygraph examiner and from uh from that, ended up starting to study uh, the process of interview and interrogation. When you when you think about the um, learning more or studying more about interview and interrogation, and you go backwards, think about your time, even with the in, with the train or with the police department. How much how much training or knowledge do you think you had when you were actually doing that job versus what you had after you decided that that was a passion of yours? Uh, I would say almost none. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I went through the academy, um, I think we had 45 minutes on interviewing. um, And it was, the instructor was talking out of a book he had read. It wasn't his knowledge at all. And I know that because I had just read the book. Right. So (laughs) the examples that he was using as his own weren't his. And You know, I mean, to say that it was rudimentary would be an understatement because nobody really had a a sense of how to go about doing uh, 
an, either an interview or what we were at that point calling interrogations. So um, yeah. it wasn't until I was trained as a polygraph examiner that I finally had somebody say, here's a way to do it. Yeah, I think that's crazy. We see that, as you know, um, in a lot of our training classes, learning about how much time is actually spent in an academy on de-escalation or rapport building or interviewing versus how to drive a car and defensive tactics and how to shoot a gun. It seems like it's a little lopsided. Well, well for sure. I mean, the biggest return on investment is communication. And I mean, all those things that you mentioned are, are basic communication needs that you, you need in, a, in the field. Um, or if in the private sector, in, in business meetings or anything else, it's, it's all about communication. Uh, the other skills are obviously important, but they certainly don't, um, they don't ha have the return on investment that uh, focusing on an, on an interview, yeah. whether it's pre-employment or an investigative interview can give you. Do you think um, more effective communication could have saved your shoes that night from being the product of a vomit? Uh, I think probably a little more observation on my part would right. have been, would have <laughs> right. been better. Um, yeah. There was a short span of listening that indicated there was going to be a problem shortly, but I was in the wrong <laughs> position to do anything about it. But it's too bad. I'm assuming that predated body cams, but that might have been a good one for your uh, for your records. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so I know part of what I wanted to talk to you about, you, you've been through, like we just mentioned, kind of this, this transition of what communication or interviewing look like, uh, kind of what you were a part of, and maybe what you were trained on, and then uh, and founding WZ and what you've brought to you know, thousands and thousands of investigators across the globe has changed throughout the years. But maybe in the very beginning, I know your personality is very conversational and kind of rapport driven and, and active listening. And how did that work, I guess, with maybe what you were trained to do at the time or what some of the other interview methods look like? Well, it, it, um, it was really almost entirely the opposite for me. Um, the, the general strategy was if the person failed the polygraph, you'd go in and you'd tell them, you failed, you did it. They would say, no, I didn't. You would say, au contraire. Right. And then the back and forth would begin. And I was horrible at it. I mean, they, you know, I went back through uh, interview training uh, three times because I just... And it was it was just contrary to who I was, and it I didn't think it worked well. Yeah. Um, and I finally made some alterations and started to get better results. But it was it was a move away from that confrontational, direct accusation at the very beginning. Well, that and that piece, um, you know, when you say it out loud. I know we we've, we've taught it in some of our training classes. It seems so obvious that when you directly accuse somebody of something, their first natural response is going to be to say, I didn't do it for the most, for the most part, which initially puts somebody in this kind of resistant, you know, defensive posture. I would imagine that same thing. I know we got a lot of listeners that probably don't conduct interviews or haven't yet, but I would imagine that same concept could apply talking to a significant other or a coworker or an employee. If you're asking something, you know, they're going to say no right away, that maybe you should spend some time preparing for that before you hit them with an accusation or a, an ask right away? Oh, I, I think that's absolutely right. Anytime you back somebody into a corner and you force them to deny whatever it is, they're, now they have to protect it because now not only did they do it, but they directly lied to you about it and the resistance goes up and it becomes more and more difficult to get an admission. Um, I yeah. mean, when I was, you know, part of the problem I was having as a, as a, a polygraph examiner was they'd already been interviewed once mm -hmm. and said, I didn't do it. And they may have even been confronted with evidence and said, I didn't do it. Now they come in for the polygraph. They don't pass. 
and I tell them they didn't do it. They've, I mean, they've already been programmed to deny. I denied it the first time, I'm still here. I denied it the second time, I'm still here. I deny it here, maybe I'll still be here. Yeah. So it it it's um I think your point is exactly on uh on task is that if you can avoid backing somebody into a corner and forcing them to deny, um, you're gonna be much better off. Yeah, and you're not gaining any information. But I'm I'm thinking as you were going through that, I was thinking about um, we get a ton of sales calls or even LinkedIn messages that are trying to sell us on some product or service. And it's if the if the attempt to make you buy something is made so early in the conversation and you decide, no, I'm not interested, I, I feel like it makes that salesperson's job twice as difficult because not, not, not only do they have to now sell me that it was a good product, they also have to tell me I made the wrong decision when I said no in the first place. Well, and, you know, I mean, it's basically need satisfaction selling. You know, first I have to discover a need and then have to attach your need to my sales pitch. Yeah. And right. if you don't, if you can't see that need to do it, to buy whatever it is I'm selling, you're not going to buy no matter how glitzy and fine of a presentation I have. It just, it, you don't see why you need to do it. Right. Well, one of the questions that that came in that's uh, kind of correlates with that is this concept of what you experienced is kind of what what you were comfortable with versus what you found more effective. And now you you know founded with Doug Wicklander WZ in 1982, so for over over 40 years now training new investigators or experienced investigators, but a lot of that is training them on maybe methods or techniques that are not what they're used to or trying to tell somebody in a unique way that, Hey, there's a better way to do that. But any thoughts or just kind of discussion around what it's been like to, I guess, training old dogs, new tricks and some of the resistance or acceptance you felt along the way. You know, it's funny. Um, some of the, the people who had been doing it for years were like, God, I wish I had known this 20 years ago. So it, there wasn't the resistance. They recognized the problem that they were having and the difficulties, but they didn't know a better way to do it. So whatever they were doing, they just continued to do that. Um, now, obviously, there are a few people out there who just said, well, you don't know anything. You're going to find that in almost any, any discussion. But, um, you know, one of the things was, um, you know, act actually going through and talking about problems that people had at the very beginning. And so, so basically what I was trying to do is have them identify in their experience what was a, what was a difficult conversation that they were having. And once you started to talk about that and, and the difficulty, I mean, you'd get people who would say, well, people always do this to me. Or people always say this, right? And they said, "Well, what's you know? What do I say?" So, well, it, that's not that's not the problem. The problem is what led up to that, right? And you know, it could be the strategy, it could be what you're saying, it could be your attitude. I mean, it could be a whole bunch of things. That's not the problem. That's just a symptom of where the problem actually lies. Yeah. And so once you start to step that back and look at what happened before and what are they doing before, then you can tweak that to get a better result. And that's that's how I um, got around people who um, were resistant. And I have to say, over the years, um, most people would, were very acceptant because, like me, they never got any real training. You know, they had right. they had a mentor. Or a, tr a training officer who said, "Well, you know, just go in and do this," you know, and and that's it doesn't tell you why that works, right? Or why it doesn't work. It just says, "Well, here here's something to say." Yeah, and it may not work with your personality or the amount of evidence you have or the type of case. I like that concept. It's kind of like letting them identify the problem, and you can help diagnose it. We we still get that all the time in 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 classes. Well, this person said 
they kept saying I didn't do it or they were resistant. They didn't want to talk to me. What should I have done next? And you're right. It's almost, well, what did you do before? Right. What was the context that led up to that? Or maybe the person was just having a bad day or maybe they didn't do it or maybe they maybe they just don't like you. Right. There's a lot of other reasons, reasons for that, which, which transitions into this other concept, another a question that we get all the time. I think historically there was always maybe a, a singular method or a singular approach that you'd almost use on in every or almost every context. And now in today's interviewing world, you've got, you know, cognitive interviewing, um, which I know WZ has been, been training for quite some time now. You've got, you know, strategically using evidence, a participatory method, trauma-informed interviewing. Um, you've got all these different concepts and being adaptable, I think, to the situation is is important. But was that always the case, do you feel like, in the field? Or what, I guess, maybe what's the importance of having flexibility in your strategy? Well, most of the time, um, people have a single strategy because it's 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 worked as good as they could make it work. Right. And it's easy because they don't have to think. So they go back and, and just press play and say the same things in the same way that they've always done it. And the end result is basically they get what they get at the same yeah. level that they're getting, whether that be an informational interview, um, you know what? Where we are today, I think, is so much better because finally, um, we're getting some some research into the whole process to understand, you know, what's good or what's not good. I, I can remember um, when I was on the police department in the interview, I you know I would I would start jumping around, which is exactly the wrong thing, right? To, you know, by today's standards, but. But for me, I didn't know any better, and I, it seemed like I was getting information I hadn't gotten before, but I think I was, I know I was completely wrong based on the research today. I, that There's a question that came up that I think you just started to allude to some of this. What do you think, maybe either you personally, and I, I could answer this as well on my side, are the biggest mistakes or failures we could we could probably have a whole episode just on that. But if you had to point out one or two things, the biggest mistakes or failures that interviewers make, maybe maybe personally or what you've seen in the industry. Um, I think it's not being able to change. You know, it's 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 what's comfortable for you to do is the easiest thing to do, yeah. and. It takes time to change, to break, I mean, essentially to break a habit. You know, I've, had, I've heard people say it takes 30 days to break a habit. You got to do something different for 30 days to make that the norm. Um, you know, and once you, once you can get out of that habit of doing something and be able to um, open, open your eyes to other possibilities, other pathways that you can go to. Um, to me, that I think is the most difficult part. And, you know, it, and I'm sure you've seen this as well in, in some of the classes, you know, it's what we do when we do uh, an introductory statement sounds easy because right. we've done thousands of them. Um, but somebody who's just starting out, it, that's a pretty intimidating structure to go through and you know so it's easy to fall back into the trap of doing what we've always done and change requires some practice and it requires a consistent uh, attention to being aware of where you need to be and what you're doing that you're not and yeah and i you have a good there's a good example of a case i've seen i saw you do who was a homicide uh investigation and I think it goes to this this point of having an open mind in the interview, being able to adapt, right? Being a good because if you're if you're so focused on I got to say this word and this sentence is next, here's my next question. You're not actively listening. But in the case I'm thinking of, you know, you have somebody in front of you who evidence suggests might be the guilty party, but you heard some information during that interview that you transitioned 
into a fact gathering interview to determine about the alibi. Um, but that, I think that flexibility is difficult for people because a lot of, whether you're an interviewer or just a general human being, we have confirmation bias and tunnel vision. If something, something looks guilty and smells guilty and feels guilty, these biases make us want to right, prove right. them guilty. But I don't know if you remember that in that the context of that case, but what is it's just even that concept of being a good active listener and being able to adapt, I think is kind of what you were just describing. Yeah. And, yeah. and knowing what, uh, knowing what your resources are going to be, you know, uh, in, in a, in a police interview, for example, to take a homicide, um, you're going to have, you know, you need a timeline of what, what went on. You need the person's story in great detail um, because you may never ultimately get the person to say, I did it. But if you can prove that the alibi or the events that he says happened or didn't happen occurred, then that's, that's as, as good as, as a confession that they did it because mm -hmm. it speaks to the ultimate um, involvement in the case. Right. And gives you, I think that's a really good point. gives you more information to go investigate, right? Cause you could corroborate or disprove what they said. And I think it's the same thing we were talking about, you know, the kind of a sales call before, if your whole goal is to get the, I did, the, I did it or in a sales process to get the, I'll, I'll buy it, but you don't actually listen to maybe other needs the customer has or other obstacles that they're facing. You're missing out on a bigger, a bigger picture. I, I think in the same kind of wavelength, one of the biggest mistakes interviewers make, and this one is on, on me too, is interrupting people in their, in their story, uh, not allowing for silence and, in the many years I've known you and watched watched interviews or just had conversations with you, sometimes with or without alcohol involved, but you, one of your strengths I know is allowing silence, asking the question or just having a conversation, letting somebody finish their thought or their story, and sometimes even allowing a couple seconds of silence after that before you you reengage. Is that is that something you think that is just natural for you, or is that something you had to? to focus on? Cause I know that's definitely an opportunity for a lot of interviewers out there. Uh, no, I, it was definitely not me at the beginning. Cause I was, you know, just, I would talk nonstop. Yeah. Um, you know, during an interview where I was trying to get an admission, um, and letting the person, you know, when, when you're, uh, you're listening to a story, and and I do this all the time now. It's just <clears throat> second nature for me. But when I'm listening to an interview on TV or somebody giving a speech, I'm listening for, you know, are they delivering facts? Are they delivering opinions? Are they delivering emotions? Uh, I'm I'm looking for what are they saying, but what aren't they saying? And then you can begin to ask yourself, okay, if they said this. Why, why aren't they focusing on this piece over here? You know, if somebody says, you know, I think, well, once that piece of the conversation is over, I'm going to say, well, what made you think that way? Right. And how did you come to that conclusion? Because, you know, that's not an observation. That's a conclusion that they reach based on what they've known before. Uh, or their experience, and how did how did they arrive at the decision to say I think? So those are those are the kinds of things that I think um, early on I missed a lot. Um, I think most now we both said I think, and now that's all I'm going to listen. I'm, all I'm going to pick up on as I'm listening to interviews. But that that is uh, that's good feedback, and that's something that we see you know all the time. Those those qualifying words or language when somebody says you know. I'm, uh, I'm usually on time for work. Well, usually doesn't mean always, but I I've I know I've been in this position as the interviewer or the conversation manager where you're so focused on getting to a certain point that you almost just you heard that word but you didn't actually actively listen to that word. And so instead of kind of reflecting on the statement and asking a better probing question, you just jump to whatever topic you want to go to next. Well, and and just to expand on that, I think is if if you 
if you get somebody who says something like that, that's a perfect opportunity. You know, you've basically got a tacit admission that, you know, I left jobs off my resume. Uh, right. I, I'm late for work. So the next question should be, are you ever late for work? It should be, you know, in an average month, how many times would you say you're late for work? I mean, are we talking pretty much every day or is it just less than that? So that's an opportunity that you have to elicit an admission because they've opened the door for that. Right. Right. They've acknowledged something occurred. You're trying to find out to the extent of the damage, essentially, of what that, yes. what that might be. But it's, but it's because they've already essentially <clears throat> admitted it. And, it, and a right. tacit admission could be, it could be silence, you know, or it could be a nod of the head, um, or it could be some kind of a qualifier that says, well, yeah, I kind of do that, but not all the time. And then you can expand uh, that admission at that point. Yeah, and that I, I have another uh, episode. We've talked to a guest who uh, has done investigations with uh, gang members, and he went through some training. It's kind of your same uh, kind of evolution of going from a very direct accusation, running the conversation, to then being an active listener. And this this kind of goes in two parts. One is he was able to observe how frustrated he was with himself because he kept, every time somebody would go to answer a question, he would interrupt them. And he said to me, you know, my whole goal was get these people to give me as much information as possible. And all I kept doing was shutting them down from talking. And so it's just, it, it's counterintuitive to, to the process. But the second piece that I want to ask you about is the only way he was able to review that is because they were all video recorded. Mm -hmm. And I know that's, you know, in, in today's world, I think we're at 31 or 32, maybe now states uh, that have uh, rules of evidence that you have to have interrogations that are recorded from start to finish. And that's growing in popularity. But you and, and the WZ team have been recording at least since 1982, I think some probably heavier recording devices than these little body cams we have now. But what was the, how did that come about to be your standard and what, what are some of the benefits or risks you saw with that? Uh, well, if you do something stupid, it's there for everybody to see, right? <laughs> um, right. If you do something illegal, it's there for everybody to see. Um, and that, and that I think is, is one of the benefits because I think that um, it encourages the interviewer to stick to the rules and not take chances. Um, so I think, first of all, it's good evidence of what happened in that room. You know, it's not somebody going out, well, he beat me. Well, okay, here's here's the hour and a half we were together. There's no breaks. There's no beatings occurring. Um, the subject's lying. Right. Um, so it's it, it, first of all, protects the interviewer. Uh, and evidence is the, um, the interview. Second thing that it does is it, allows uh, other investigators to get either a contemporaneous hearing of the statements and do fact checking for you that they can feed that information back to you. Um, if, you know, later you want to confront the, uh, the misstatements or the lies or the contradictions that the evidence would have, um, it, it also allows, um, from a, a mentoring standpoint, some, you know, traditionally a lot of uh, a lot of organizations would have a new interviewer sit with an older person who's got more experience, and then afterwards they would try to give feedback. And you, I didn't say that, you mm -hmm. know, or I, you know, right. it didn't sound like that, or that's not how I meant it, or whatever. But now you can go back and actually review exactly what happened. And, and and give crystal clear feedback. They can see and hear what you're talking about. And it's a much more powerful uh, way to do it. And, and I think the last thing is it's, it's just, um, it, it's a way to, to measure performance of, of the interviewer. I mean, I've had, uh, uh, supervisors tell me, oh, this is the best, this is my best guy. Mm -hmm. and you, you listen to it 
And at the end, he got the admission, but it took him two hours to get there. And, right. you know, you know, you can do, you can do a whole bunch of things and, and have a, a good ending to you. But are you, are you doing it the best way, the, the shortest way, uh, the most efficient way? Yeah. When you, when you said, um, you know, looking back and somebody said, well, that's not how it went. Or, uh, I remember it a certain way. I was thinking that a lot of people, including myself listening, probably wish you could record some arguments with significant others and be able to replay that and critique it a little bit. I think that would be, that might be helpful or hurtful depending on what side of the argument that you. I, I think it would be horrifying. Right. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> well, but I think it's, what's kind of funny with that. And it's the same that was an in interview is, you know, you say something in response so quickly, you know, somebody says, I didn't do it. Or, Are you accusing me? Or what's this about? And, or, you know, you're only accusing me because, and it's, you know, maybe age, race, gender, whatever that person feels like might be the, their perception, the immediate response of the interviewer is is probably the wrong one. It's it's often of kind of high emotion and low quality. And it's the same thing I think about like in a personal argument, you're in this kind of little heated battle. And so you've got that witty response, which sounds good in the moment, but you don't realize that you're going to have to pay, pay for that for the next six to 18 months. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and part of that, you know, I think is um, when you know something, a difficult conversation is going to happen um, is, is anticipating where those problems are going to lie. Right. And, and, you know, either based on what the person has done in the past, I'm a, I'm a big believer in um, if you're going to interview somebody, I want to know, how do they handle conflict? You know, how, how, if they've been disciplined, how do they deal with it? What did they do? Because then you can begin to predict what their, what their strategy is going to be. And so then you don't typically fall so easily into those, uh, those traps that you fall in, into, you know, by surprise, because you've already anticipated, you know, so if, if it's going to be a racial, a sexual comeback, if it's going to be a, um, you know, de dealing with anger, you know, right. you can anticipate it and have a plan of how you're going to have it. And then if that happens, you can execute it or better is you can avoid the whole problem in its entirety by avoiding those, those minefields, if you will. Yeah. And, and going back on video and being able to listen to yourself is help is helpful. I know personally for me, when one of my, um, opportunities is if I'm in a conversation and the person, I feel like they're either lying to me or they're being combative or whatever it might be. My, I didn't know this until I watched on, on video, but my tone gets a little sharper, more pointed. It almost, I almost feel like I turn into a cross-examining attorney, which is, as you mentioned earlier, like the complete opposite of an effective conversation. But as soon as my my anger went up, it came across and how I was questioning somebody. I don't think I would have recognized that unless I had to watch it for myself. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the great values of um, having a video or a recording is that there, there's so much that we have in tonal qualities and how loud or how softly we speak and the pacing that we have. Um, you know, if you're talking too fast, people can't process it. Yeah. And, you know, looking at somebody who has a particular pace of the language and all of a sudden they slow way down. Well, that just says to me they're being careful what they're saying and picking their words carefully. And so there might be something there that I want to go back to at some point and explore in a little more depth. So, you know, all those things are in play. I mean, this is, to me, communication between people is unbelievably complex, right? It, you know, it's the physical, it's the verbal, it's what's being said, what's not being said. It's the, the choice of the word that they have picked. Those are all critical. Well, and I think the, because it's so complex, um, you know, there's this, this concept known as the cognitive load theory, where you've got 
so much that's processing at, at one time. And as a, as an interviewer, you know, you're, or anybody managing a conversation, you're thinking about all these different things. You're, you're observing, you're maybe taking notes. You're thinking, what am I going to say next? What's this question I have to ask? And when you have so much going on, you're, you're bound to miss something. And so I, I also feel like, you know, in the past when you're doing a, an interview and maybe you got an, I did it or an, I didn't do it. And that was kind of the outcome. Like you said before, maybe they felt successful because that was the outcome. I, and so which meant there's pressure on that outcome. I think with video, it helps for the first piece is now I can go back and listen later if I need to take more thorough notes or I need to check on something. And then the second piece, and I'm curious what you think about this. I feel like as an interviewer, it, it removes a little bit of that pressure on confession because I know the entire one hour, two hour conversation where I just lock somebody into a story or gain more details can be just as, if not even more valuable. Yeah, and I, I I think that you're exactly right. Uh, I I had a case years ago where it was with a um, huge company, and it was a regional vice president. And the guy makes probably more than most of us make in five years, right? In in one, and he's you know he's arrogant, he's condescending, he's you know. He's a bit of a gambler, so he's got, you know, he's a risk taker. Um, and the odds of getting this person to say that he was he was stealing um, were going to be very, very limited. And and so for him, the, the strategy that I employed was based on what I thought he was going to do, which is he was going to stonewall the whole thing. Right. So we went through and I locked him into, you know, removing product from bins and, you know, under what circumstances, what paperwork, whatever. And he, you know, he gives the song and dance according to policy. And then we ended up showing him the video of him taking it out. And that's, that's what ultimately got him fired was the fact that he violated policy that he'd articulated first. So, you know, not everybody is going to give information or uh, make an admission. And so you have to kind of look at the process globally and then choose your strategies, um, you know, to, um, to give you the best outcome that you can possibly get, I guess. Yeah, no, I like that. And that, and having this identifying some goals and objectives before the conversation, which are not necessarily confession centered, but information gathering relative to what what you may or may not have in front of you at the time, right? Either to support or dispute that. I think a lot of times people, because they watch Law and Order or CSI or whatever, they imagine that that interview is the final culmination of everything. So that means you got all this evidence and you somebody said, I did it and good job. I'm done with the conversation. But I feel like a lot of these interviews happen throughout an investigation, right? There's, if you think about, it, you mentioned a homicide case earlier, you might have, you know, a dozen witnesses to maybe one suspect. And so there's a lot more conversations happening where your goal is just, how do I just get details to investigate further? Well, and, you know, what are you going to do after the fact? Are you going to go back and investigate? You know, right. a lot of times there's the, the interview that you're going to have with the person at the end is the end of it. And you, you aren't necessarily going to take that statement and go back. Um, and try to disprove it, you know, because that's, there's not enough resources to do it. Uh, but, you know, if, if you, um, I, I had a, a, a guy that had killed a couple of women and he, his story was on the second woman was, well, I was asleep in the chair at the barbershop. And, you know, the woman was killed and, and put into a car and or into a truck and the truck was set on fire. And so through, through just interviewing and expanding, um, I moved him from the point of, I was asleep to, I heard something to, well, I looked at and saw the whole thing out the back window and his, he's either the best witness that you would ever have in any case you've ever had, or he did it. And, right. 
you know, unfortunately for him, he was a little careless with his DNA. So uh, <laughs> that darn DNA will get will get them every every yes. time. Or thankful to DNA has helped us understand when it's been wrong sometimes in the past. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The um, I know one of the the last kind of areas I wanted to explore. We get a lot of questions now on how these concepts apply in in more of the human resources field. And I know mm -hmm. you were uh, integral and in, and in integral in kind of developing an HR focused training program years ago with the organization, and it's continued to kind of blossom from there. But specific to hiring, right? A lot of people are out there just hiring new employees, and they're having these an interview. So it's not necessarily an interrogation, although it might feel like it, but have you felt like some of these skills can translate to those types of just screening conversations to be a better um, assessor of who you're going to hire? Yeah. And, and, you know, again, I, the evolution of, from when we first started, um, I mean, basically people would take a resume and say, well, you were here from this to this. Yeah. And what'd you do? Well, I, did this, this, and this. Okay, let's move on. Um, so basically all you were doing was confirming what they put on their on the resume. And so what the general trend has been is to go to a, a, a more behavioral focused interview. So going back to what I mentioned before, which is it's easy to do what you've always done. Yeah. And so when you put somebody into a situation, well, you know, tell me a time where you had to deal with uh, a conflict with a customer. And now you get firsthand. How did, what did they do? Did they handle it appropriately? Is there room for development? Is, is this, you know, going to be a, a problem that's unfixable? Um, you know, so you can make a better decision. And so I think the idea of uh, looking at and eliciting from the person um, what their general patterns of performance are. You know, what, you know, have, have what what steps did you have to go through from beginning to end of a project that you did? So now you can see how they organized it, what they did. That gives you so much more information than have you ever been in charge of a product? Uh, yes, I have. I have I had to take a product and you know develop it. A couple times. Well, it doesn't tell you much about how they performed, or you know, what's what's your preference in in you know counseling an employee? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think and asking those other behavioral based questions lends itself to what you've already what you've already shared with us today is uh, silence is powerful from the interviewer. So if it's, Hey, tell me about a time you had a conflict with a coworker or whatever, and how you handled it, let them tell their story and allow for some silence after that story. Right. So they, they don't feel like okay. you, you nodded, you said, okay, check, check the box. And I think the other thing it does, and you, you've really reinforced this with me over the years is it allows you to ask the most simple interview question ever, which is tell me more about that. And you can just continue to expand on whatever story they gave with really little pressure on you as the interviewer. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's yeah. probably one of the most powerful questions you ask. Tell me more about that. So you're not, you're not giving them a starting point. You're letting them choose where they're going to begin. And that may tell you there's, they've avoided a, a key spot here that we need to go back to, or, you know, then again, you listen to the word choice that they've made. And, uh, you know, word choices um, on both sides are really, really critical. Um, you know, the uh, I was dealing with a homicide suspect and the, I was going to have to talk to him. I'd never, never met him before. So I, I had the officers put him into a room. And we just let him sit for a while. And then I went in and opened the door and go, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't know anyone was in here. And now I could have said, I didn't know you were in here. But that right. would have meant I already knew he was in there. Right. Or I knew who he was. And I didn't want that. So the use of anybody seems seems simple, but it was designed to be, this was kind of an accidental meeting. 
And then I, I went out, gave her five minutes, came back and go, you know, did anybody offer you a cup of coffee or anything? No. Would you like one? Oh, sure. Okay. Then I left again. A couple minutes later, I stick my head back in. I forgot to ask you, cream, sugar, no. you know, black's fine. Oh, okay. And, you know, so now when I walk in, I'm not a stranger anymore. I'm, I'm somebody who's who they've met, you know, who's been polite to them, who's offered them a cup of coffee. And so we have a relationship now. So something even as simple as the opening and how you think about doing it can be really important in setting the um, the likelihood of an open dialogue with the person or the complete opposite if it's done wrong i think that's that's a great example of like the personalizing something using the word you like you like you just mentioned um yeah i can think of times of people conducting an interview who maybe somebody's really simple stole money because they have financial struggles in their life and the interviewer says something like you know, I know that you're probably dealing with some financial struggles. I know you've got some extra bills and the the repetitive nature of the word you that personalizes that story immediately is going to, it's invasive and it's going to cause resistance, defensiveness. You know, what the hell do you know about me? I don't have any money problems, but instead, you know, like you just described, it can be, you know, people deal with financial struggles. And I know a friend of mine who dealt with something and it's taken away that kind of direct personalization of the of the process right. and so because you're not personalizing it they don't have to resist it right so well and that yeah and so I'm, what i'm curious about one a question that we get all the time in, the, in our training and i'm sure you've gotten before um how have all of this that we've talked about right this concept of of interviewing asking better questions active listening has that impacted or do you feel like you use it in your in your personal life at all for better or worse um yeah, I, I think I'm a much better listener than I was. Um, you know, I, you, I, I try not to bring home the job, um, but I I do listen carefully to people. And you know, for me on a on a personal level, you know, I think it, it, it when you meet somebody for the first time and you you, you know you kind of introduce yourself and you hear hear them say something i can now engage them in a, in a much more easy way to to begin with that that beginning of rapport i mean i know you asked about family rapport is either there or it's not there kind of by the nature of the right. uh, family unit but um you know it 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 tells you you know kind of you know where where's the the ouchy part of this conversation going to lie you know, especially when you're talking to, you know, teenagers who are less than communicative right. uh, on, on things, you know, they, um, you know, you can begin to, to help them feel comfortable opening up a little bit more. Yeah, no, I think that's good for me. It's probably a better perspective of people before the conversation begins, right? Having that you talked about it, but kind of having this um, internal strategy of understanding what, where might the objectives uh, be, where are their objections, where's their resistance, what's going on with them today, but also understanding their their perspective or point of view, so you can enter the conversation a little bit, a little bit open minded. And I know you and I we talked about this several times um, for some reasons frequently in a bar atmosphere, but bartenders and how hospitality, you know, workers and customer service people, but how important the same concept is for them, right? Developing rapport with all walks of life, all within, you know, a four hour shift and being able to maintain conversations, keep people happy from, from a diverse kind of client base. Yeah. And I think, you know, we all have, have friends. I've, I've got a friend that if, if we walked into a bar, it's like cheers, even if we've yeah. never been there before. He knows within a few minutes, he knows everybody, he's laughing, he's, you know, enjoying himself. And, um, you know, it's amazing how those people, and I think it's a rare talent. Um, I, I think he's just, that's just who he is. But, you know, if you observe somebody like that and see, and watch carefully how he does it, he's undoubtedly there's a strategy there, you know, and his was, 
you know, to try to make some kind of a joke and laugh. And, and once he did that and he got somebody laughing, then he would open the conversation. So that was his kind of opening gambit for that. Um, But, you know, when we decide um, who we are as, as persons, we have certain things that we like. And, and that once you know that about somebody, it tells you a whole bunch of stuff. Um, You know, it, you know, I'm, I do a little bit of wood carving uh, on the side. And, and so if you know that about me, that tells you a lot about who I am. You know, I don't, I don't mind being by myself because wood carving isn't much of a spectator sport. Right. right. Um, You know, um, so if you're, if your strategy was to leave me in a room by myself, I just put it in neutral. I'm, I'll be there all day and just be happy as a clam. Right. Um, but it also tells you that I do that I have, I think about what I'm going to do because if you take and lop off a piece of wood, you can't get it back on there real easy. Um, so I plan. Um, if if you looked at what I did at WZ, um, I I put together a lot of programs. I did a lot of writing. So all those things require planning. So you know what my hobby is is very much indicative of who I am in in the workplace and how I kind of process and put things together. And so once you know something about, you know, somebody like, you know, what are their side interests, that's going to tell you a lot about, you know, what's what's a value in their life and how do they handle things. Yeah. Yeah. Relatability or just preparation, I think that's how mm-hmm. that's really helpful. Yeah. I wanted to give you one one last question and kind of a, a chance. I know it's hard to uh put decades of experience and knowledge into one final final takeaway you shared a lot today which i appreciate but if you had one kind of one last takeaway from what what you've learned or your experience that you want to make make sure if people listen to one thing what that might be what what do you think you'd leave them with i i think the big the biggest thing is going back and and in the conversation whether it's an interview or it's a admission seeking interview uh just fact gathering is kind of an after action you know what did what did i do in there that was real good and what did i do that i could do better um you know, if i if there's a a stumbling block in there what led up to that i mean really going back and and looking at what you did and as you know we did that a lot yeah. by watching videos, you know, saying, okay, what happened here? Where do we need to go back to? What would you do different? Do some brainstorming. Uh, and to me, that's, I think, one of the big things is, you know, never stop learning and never stop evaluating what you're doing and being, don't be afraid to change because there's, there's going to be better stuff out there. Yeah, that's a good good feedback, good takeaway. Self awareness is difficult for some people, but um, critique and then acting on that critique, I think, is is important. So that's really good. A lot of a lot of really neat information today, Dave. I appreciate your your time, not just today, but obviously in the last several years of what what you've done for me and for the organization and for investigators a, across the globe. So thanks for sharing your knowledge today. Um, I'm sure we'll we'll chat again soon and. Thank you all for listening to this episode of the Truth Be Told podcast. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And to keep this conversation going, follow the Truth Be Told podcast on LinkedIn and Truth Be Told CFI on Twitter. On behalf of the International Association of Interviewers, Rick Landerzalowski and our valued sponsors, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Truth Be Told podcast.